Wonderful. Let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the Making Bird Connections virtual lecture series. Uh, tonight, we are uh, very fortunate to have the full 2021 Eastern Egg Rock Seabird Research Team with us. My name is Eva Lark. I'm the Senior uh, Manager of Polar Programs for Hog Island Audubon Camp and the Seabird Institute, which is a part of the National Audubon Society. And uh, our welcome making, our Making Bird Connection lectures are basically uh, where we bring a bird focused presentation to you each month. Uh, the presentations are free, but donations are encouraged to help fund our programs. And I will drop a donation link in the chat or comment section. Also consider if you like uh, seabirds and you want more of it, then come to Hog Island this summer. We have bird camp for adults. We'll take you out to Eastern Egg Rock and let you see uh, these seabirds that we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, but let's get started. This week, we have Kay, Emily, and Jasmine. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, these three women, they led our research efforts on our flagship seabird island in Muscungus Bay. For those that don't know, Project Puffin was founded in 1973 in an effort to learn how to restore puffins to historic nesting islands in the Gulf of Maine. And now those research methods are used worldwide. For the past 48 years, researchers have been working on Eastern Egg Rock, and we have the, the last three people to be out there um, continuing that research. So I'd like for uh, us to start tonight by having each of you introduce yourself, uh, say your name, how many summers you've worked at Audubon, and uh, what you're currently doing. Um, yeah, so I'm Kay. Uh, I worked at Project Puffin for four years, four summers, I guess. Um, and two of those summers, I was a field tech on two of the islands, um, including Egg Rock. And then I returned for two years as the supervisor of Eastern Egg Rock. Um, now I'm a PhD student at the University of California, Davis. My name is Emily Sandley. I was a research assistant on Pond Island first and then Eastern Egg Rock this past summer. So I've spent two summers with Project Puffin and now I'm currently working part-time at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. So still doing something bird related, which is awesome, but I'm glad to be here talking about seabird tonight. Hit the green button. Okay. Hi, I'm Emily Sandley. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation. Right now, I'm currently a student at Florida A&M University. Um, there, I'll be finishing out my bachelor's of animal science, and I just finished an internship with Florida Fish and Wildlife. Oh. Eva, I think you're muted. You're muted. Oh no. Eva, you're muted. <laughs> that was a fantastic introduction, oh, Eva, but um, unfortunately, could you please repeat it for us? <laughs> thanks so much. So uh, thanks for the introductions. I um, Thanks for bearing with me here. So tonight, uh, before we go into our Q&A panel. Um, we're going to share some photos from this summer. Most of these photos were taken by our volunteer photographer, Jean Hall. So um, shout out to Jean for showing and highlighting our program. And I'm going to let um, Emily and Kay and Jasmine take over the reins and tell people at home what they're looking at and how that pertains to life on a seabird island. Do you want to start off, Kay? Um, sure. Uh, this is an Atlantic puffin. For those of you who did not know that previously, although I suspect everyone here has um, identified puffins in the past. Um, and uh, we're seeing it jump into a burrow with a mouthful of hake. Um, this is a common sighting for us researchers on egg. Um, Emily and Jasmine, do you want to add to that? Yeah, you can also see those two bands, so those two metal bands we have 
the metal field readable, which has um, two, two letters and then two numbers and then a nine digit metal band that also is an identifier marker. So this is a puffin flying right into a burrow, which sometimes can be deterred by laughing gulls, which is um, a species that we deal with out on the islands. But luckily for this puffin, it seems to be getting in no problem. So here we have a, well, you can actually see the top of the one other one, but that's one of our most famous blinds and Kay's favorite that looks like Arizona out there. Um, Arizona is one of the blinds close to some loafing rocks that puffins really enjoy. So those are our observation blinds that um, we use a lot, a lot of the time for reading band numbers. Yeah, that blind is pretty funny because you can, you're sitting there and maybe you're focusing on other birds that like are across the rocks from you, but then you'll like look over to your right and there's going to be, there'll be like a puffin just standing there like a couple feet away, um, completely unaware that you're there creeping on it. Um, definitely one of the best parts about being so close to them. Yeah, this, this looks like something we dealt with some, sometimes there's ocean spray, but not often, but definitely when the, the waves crash on the side of the island, you can hear it, especially at night. <laughs> right. I can definitely attest to this one. Well, um, there's sometimes they'll, they'll sneak up on you. As I know, um, my phone was actually taken by one of these at a point in time, but yeah, you just gotta be careful. <gasps> <laughs> yeah, I feel like all of our reactions to, to this picture are just sort of like nostalgia and a little bit of wonder. Um, I, I found this picture the other day and sent it to Eva because it just made me feel happy things. Yeah, so for, for those of you who don't know, this is the Egg Rock Hill Inn, uh, which has been there for quite some time. This is kind of like our home base. And as you can see, it's very, very small. Um, mm -hmm. So this is where we cooked. This is where we did all of our research work. Um, this is where we hung out and played rummy. And this is kind of where we did everything. And you can see the, the tables too. Um, all of that mm -hmm. is our living quarters. I would just like to point out that in the middle of the summer, Kay actually made that table. Just to point out <laughs> she did. <laughs> I wasn't going to brag, but you know. <laughs> Um, I think this picture gives everyone kind of a sense of how remote we are. Um, we have our food delivered to us every every two weeks or so, um, and that includes water. So there's no running water on the island, um, and we receive it. Uh, you can see there's like a boat out there, so they will bring the food out more onto the little yellow buoy there, and then we'll row it in and lug it up the rocks to our base camp. And that's me carrying propane and water. Yeah, sometimes it's very slick trying to climb up that while you're you're moving everything. So the proper footwear, which should include covered toes, which in my case did not, um, is encouraged. But it was definitely sometimes challenging to kind of climb across the rock weed, but totally worth it to get everything onto the island. <laughs> what a great picture. So you can see me kind of uh, blowing on the the little guy there. So I, that must be a newly newly banded buddy. Um, and I was trying to blow a little fluff on him. So <laughs> you can see I'm very focused. Yeah, so we have um, some of our research operations are where we uh, will uh, monitor. We monitor several different species, um, puffins, guillemots, terns, petrels, um, and all of that involves, well, for most of those species, uh, we will sort of track chick growth. Um, and we do that first by taking uh, wing cord and weight measurements, but then eventually we'll ban them, um, which will help us identify them as they um, grow bigger and then potentially recruit in future, future years. So what Emily's doing here is she's blowing onto the foot of this baby guillemot because we yeah. just recently uh, painted its toes uh, pink. <laughs> um, and that's so that we can identify which, which baby 
is the first hatching, hatchling and which one's the second one, um, so that when we return and take future measurements, we know which one's which. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, there's Jean's chicken salad. I saw Jean popped up, so I know she's here. But this was our... Um, our 40th anniversary celebration. And this was a really fun day for us and a really special day on the island. So uh, Puffin with Fish Day is basically the celebration of the first time uh, a puffin was seen coming back with fish to Eastern Egg Rock. So we really wanted to commemorate that day. And so we got to celebrate it, which was really great. So there's Arizona again, which is one of our, our favorite spots, but this is another seabird species mixed in um, with the lone puffin on the rock there. So it looks like we have some terns here. So we also studied three different species of terns, Arctic terns, roseate terns, and common terns. Um, one of them being an endangered species, the roseate tern. This is Jazz me. I was gonna say, do you want to talk about your attire? <laughs> yes, so I'd love to talk about my attire. So I have on my world famous poop shirt that is covered in poop, of course. And I think my favorite part of my attire is the stick that is on the back of my hat. This stick is actually keeping the turns from dive bombing me. So what we'll do is we'll put something on, on the top of our hats for the turns to go after instead of going after our heads. And the bandanas on the back were just so the poop wouldn't get down my shirt and into my clothes. So that's, that, that's a defense mechanism that turns have. So that's kind of something that you grow accustomed to, mm -hmm. um, both having it on your clothes. And of course, the smell is not always pleasant. Right. Uh, but so you have designated clothing specifically for moving through the plots on the island, which is you know, we all hung them up in our respective places and let them be at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. This picture That's actually looks like we're grubbing for chicks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have, everybody has a, a different sized grubber and we use them to go into different burrows depending on how deep they were or how far the chicks were inside of the burrow. And when we did this, we usually took measurements of how the chick was growing, um, things of that nature. Anything we saw that we needed to mark down, things like that. Jasmine, do you want to say what grubbing is? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. So what we do, what we did was we took these grubbers and we went inside of these their their nests, which are cavernous, which are inside of the rocks. And we would take flashlights and we would look into them and we would actually use these hooks to grab the chicks. We would hook them around their, their little legs and we would gently guide them out so we could um, check up on them. Yeah, there it is. Uh, this is and usually, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is also pretty mild too, I would say is like, you can, I, I don't really, that must be my, someone's, that must be Emily's hat in the corner there, but. Sometimes grubbing involves being completely upside down, right guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so that's me with the puffin chick. Um, this, this chick in particular, I think is probably, it's getting close to fledging because you can see it's lost some of its uh, young chick down. And I think this also might be the puffin chick of this one burrow that when I first joined the project in 2018, uh, we were trying to break the record for most chicks grub on, grubbed on egg, which um, is a difficult feat because the boulder piles are so high. So um, we broke the record that year and this chick was involved in breaking that record. Um, and I staked it out for like two weeks. Um, it took me a long time to figure out how to, to uh, grub this little fella. Um, mm -hmm. But then I returned to it in 20. 21 as supervisor and managed to pull it out again um, obviously a different chick but potentially the same breeding pair and if anyone is wondering about the numbers on the rock so yes all of the burrows are marked by number um, as the years go on sometimes the researchers will find different burrows and mark those different numbers um, so all the puffin burrows are red but the cool thing is a lot of those burrows will get reused every year and sometimes by the same breeding pair and sometimes by different ones. 
Oh, you should when I, I sneak attacked you with this. <laughs> so this was my first time holding a puffin chick. I was very reluctant to do it at first. And then Kay kind of, you know, she, she. <laughs> Force you. <laughs> yes, I didn't want to say force. I didn't want to say worse. They okay, forced me to hold this chick, and it was just one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had, as you can tell on my face. You're like enjoying the fact that it's grabbing you, but also just very smitten by the puffin. Yes, I was really touched. Um, I don't know. It. I don't know. Just holding it, it just did something to my spirit. It just. I don't know. That was, was one of my favorite friend. pictures of all time. <laughs> This is a good picture too. Kay took this one. As you can see, there's dirt all the way up my arm. So this is one of our other species uh, called Alicia storm petrel. And these guys are nocturnal. So during the day, what we had to do was work very efficiently to get them out of their burrows and to ban them. So this is an adult storm petrel that I'm holding. And what's really neat about where they nest on the island is they're actually in sod burrows which the sod burrows were remnants from the original burrows that were used to transplant puffins uh, 40 years ago. So that's really awesome that we're able to work with another species now and they have more habitat because of that. <laughs> so this is us cheersing to a, a probably long day. Um, and I'm not sure what we're eating there, but it looks good. And as you can see, our, our fancy clothesline and our outhouse, which is uh, shaped like a fish in the background. So that's kind of like the vista view we got every day, which was something really beautiful. And, you know, you feel lucky to have a view like that and to be surrounded by the island. Oh. There's so this lo actually looks like I'm doing the morning count. So every morning we had chores to do. And the first one was the morning count. We would get on the roof of the Egg Rock Hilton and count the different species and how many of each bird there, were, there was. You can see our weather station too. <laughs> uh, this is a group, a group picture. Um, uh, all of us holding our different decoys. This is part of our celebration. So we got a cool picture taken. Yeah, I found that, uh, I guess you can't see it anymore, but I found that vest, some, it was just in stuff in the cabin uh, and the TAM, which if you go back and look at uh, the Project Puffin book or any of the like old puff, there's a lot of like puffin memorabilia inside the cabin. If you mm -hmm. look through any of it, you will find a picture of Steve Kress wearing a TAM and maybe also wearing that vest. So it was also my goal to just emulate him and I think this was on was this on one of the spe I feel like this was maybe on one of the special days that we were trying to celebrate it definitely was. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's my coffee cup right there um and my I can smell cup. it Emily I can like smell your bagel <laughs> just by looking at that <laughs> so this, the, that's basically our stove that's how we cooked everything this is our little home base and that's that's my morning breakfast and there's jasmine's tea um i could smell the the zinger tea now too um, <laughs> but yeah this is you know we used a camp stove for everything oh no <laughs> life on the island is hard <laughs> it, 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 it actually it, looks like a rainy day too it, it probably is because i see yeah. Kay's book there too so this was probably one of the days where, you know, we get stuck inside doing research and, you know, doing day to days. And as you can see, I'm on my phone. So I, I know cell reception is sometimes hit or miss on the island, but for, for some days you want it a little bit more just so you're not completely losing your mind. So it can be nice to alleviate. Yeah. I think to add on to that, I think one of the things I learned from this summer was, uh, that the field season is kind of, even though it's short duration, it's kind of, short duration is in three months. It's kind of a marathon. Like it's easy mm -hmm. to get burnt out if you push yourself too hard. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to be able to have time to, you know, look at your phone or have a beer outside like Emily and I in that other photo. Um, I feel like these guys really taught me that uh, balance is important. <laughs> And we, yeah. I think that was one of the reasons why we functioned well is because we 
listen to each other's needs that way. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, that's our dish cleaning setup. Very yep. exciting. <laughs> so we have our like soapy water on one side and then the rinse water on the other. Um, and then all of our our dairy and our cold goods would stay in that cooler. But to be cool. honest, it, it would only stay cool for a few days. So we really limited, you know, the amount of cold things we would bring out to the island. So a lot of it was like canned foods um, and, you know, things that wouldn't go bad right away. And under the dishwashing station, you can actually see where we stored our water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you ever want to treat any of the egg rock biologists to something in the future, they'll probably, especially in the later months, July and August, uh, would love it if you brought them ice cream. Not ice cream. I'm we got ice cream. Any, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So these are our tents um, and we have a guest tent on the front platform. And then there's my tent behind that Jasmine's and you can barely see Kay's, um, but this is the living situation. So we each had our own individual tents and then covered them with tarps to kind of keep ourselves weatherproof, at least hopefully. Um, and, you know, sometimes you end up with a ripped tarp in the morning or it's flying off a little bit. So that's the living situation, but it's kind of nice to have your own little space. <laughs> so our famous fish outhouse. So again, with no running water, um, we had an outhouse that we used peat moss mixed in with um, to keep it from smelling. Um, and then, you know, that had a little mirror and stuff. So you can kind of prep yourself if you wanted to a little bit and clean up but yeah does anyone want to guess what kind of fish that is maybe you can put it in the chat <laughs> this is designed by sue Schubel. Hmm. so that's me and i think that's heaven blind um posing for a shot i think but uh yeah so that's a scope we would use those to uh recite puffin bands and um Sometimes we would identify turns that way as well using the bands that Emily described earlier. The, those lines are very tight quarters. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes we're sitting in there for a few hours at a time, which for, is not for everyone. And often you're sitting on a, a bucket with a little um, mat on top. So it can get a little uncomfortable. So it's a lot of shifting around, but definitely again, worth a. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> oh, these are the ones by the window. Gavin turn, yeah. <laughs> uh, these are were uh, two of our our feeding study chicks, actually, and the mama. And as you can see, she's trying to um, hug her little ones and keep them safe. Yeah, if the little chicks get out into the grass when they're when it's raining, they um, they're more prone to dying of exposure which is also the reason why we don't go out in the colony when it's wet. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of a turn standing on my head. I'm almost positive I have a chick in my hand, as you can see. So a lot of times we'd go out to do the, the studies on these spots and the turns would be very weary of what we were doing with their chicks as they have a right to be. And so they would swoop down and peck us and things of that nature. But this one just wanted to watch what I was doing with the child, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh this yeah. is an awesome action shot it is. <laughs> i so, love it yeah this is after grubbing uh out that chick that i'm currently holding in my hand and maybe it's that i can't sit up and also bring the chick out of its burrow at the same time but mm. i feel like the real tragedy in this picture is my hair uh <laughs> 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 we don't really <laughs> we don't really get to shower um I mean, we can swim in the ocean, but it's not the same. No, and you can <laughs> see the effort that went into getting that puffin chick out of the burrow. That just tells you how difficult it can be sometimes. And this is our largest blind. This is tower blind, which is where a lot of uh, guests will come into the blind, um, guests that are visiting the island. 
Um, and one of our, our feeding study diet study plots for puffins as well, because they're so close. So this is a really good place to see puffins up close and personal. Oh, <laughs> this is our first group picture and the first puffin, puffin of the season. I know. So this is actually our first puffin. This is, oh, is this from Velvet? I believe okay. so. So this was our first puffin of the season. And it's actually also the first puffin I had ever caught, held, anything of that nature. So this brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> I just want to interject that uh, you can tell it's early in the season because you're so clean looking. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> oh, yeah. So okay. this, this is, um, we were we were exploring routes uh, to different parts of the island earlier in the season because mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to, you know, minimize disturbance and. Uh, walking through the, so if you can imagine, I mean, you've seen pictures already of sort of the general island layout. In the center, there's all of this vegetation and um, over the course of the season, it just gets taller and taller. Um, but earlier on the season, it's rather low and I was walking through the center one time and I just hear this little cheeping and I keep walking. And then I walk by there later and I'm like, wait, this is, this is something, this is like something important. And I like investigate a little bit and then I find these little like chickies really close to the ground. Honestly, it, they were being dangerous. They didn't realize it uh, <laughs> right by our footpath. Um, really cute. Did we decide that they were song they're, sparrow chicks? They're probably song sparrows. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we weren't totally sure at first, but um, did a little investigating and we think that they were probably song sparrow chicks. So there's more than just seabirds on this island. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Emily, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't the first person to see this, I don't think, but this is kind of hard to see. Um, this gives you a glimpse into like the harder parts of, of living on the island and being in a, in a seabird colony is, of course, what you see day to day is the mort mortality. Um, so this is an, an older uh, Cody chick, a common turn chick and it's parent and they were actually found like this and you can see that chick was pretty close to fledging age probably within a week or so and the sad the sad part about this is that chick likely died from starvation and we're not really sure if the adult just couldn't bear it um or if it was something similar because there was a, a lot of issues with the food on the island this year yeah i feel like you can you can tell better when the chicks are suffering because you see them every day, every other day. It's harder to tell when the parents are suffering because we don't do like constant measurement of them. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, feeding your chick constantly on food resources that aren't there tires mm -hmm. you out. And a lot of these adult birds are constantly making the calculus of whether they should stay and try to feed their chick or give up um, because it's a cost to, to their own um, health and like future reproductive years. So it, it is really sad to think that this parent um, made the heroic choice to stay, but uh, mm -hmm. clearly suffered the ultimate cost in return. Yeah. Since this day. <laughs> Meanwhile. <laughs> so we're, we're celebrating in this photo um, a day that every, uh, every one of the islands gets to do, which is census day. So this is a very long, tiring day. And thankfully we had Sue and Emmy Lou who um, worked on one of the torpos and she, she worked for the project and they came out and they helped us count every single turn nest on the island that day, every common turn nest. So it's a very long day. Yeah, we were working from probably six or seven until 7 p.m. And the, I was going to say, this may or may not be the same day, but I think it's due. Uh, um, it's probably not the same day, but we are definitely celebrating something <laughs> or just being weird. I think that was my, maybe it was the day that I finished the table. You made the table. So... Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, 
which are big box traps that we use to catch the puffins. <laughs> Mm, so this is me. I'm in the process of recording notes, I think, on some of the chicks we were working with. I see grubbers in the background there, so we probably were doing guillemots or puffins. Uh, and you can see my knee pads up front and center, which normally it was, it was Emily that would wear the, the knee pads, but uh, yep. the rocks were so hard that it was a necessary addition to the wardrobe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, Jasmine, you want to talk about your body? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so this is the Jean Hall, everyone. So um, this is a rainy day that we had, but she was out taking pictures. She actually went out in the rain to get shots of puffin. What? It was the... Um... <laughs> I'm trying to think. This we have the puffins that people actually adopt, adopt a puffins. Why couldn't I think of that? Adopt a puffins. And she was working so hard to get this one adopt a puffin. So she went out in the rain and actually sat there to try to take this pictures of this adopt a puffin. The dedication is real. Honestly. Oh, <laughs> the loud in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, this is a good picture. That's it's not um, who founded the project, and then Dr. Don Lyons, who is the executive director of the Seabird Institute. <laughs> oh man, fishbowl. Do you want to explain? <laughs> so the, this is the Pink Lady 2, which is one of um, the several tour boats that would go around the island every day. Um, it's awesome to see so many folks um, enthusiastic about puffins and wanting to see them when, you know, we get to see them all the time. And uh, you can see kind of that, that box trap in the front there is what we would use to catch puffins. So there is basically a, a thread with a metal piece at the end that would slide into the opening in that box and you would sit on the other end. And when a puffin would jump onto it, you would pull it and the puffin falls delicately onto a stack of pillows. Um, and then we, we would plump the pillows every time. Yes. <laughs> I'm also gonna mention that on many of the boats that come out and circle Egg Rock, uh, we do have our Audubon staff narrating those boats and our seasonal uh, positions are open. So I will drop uh, a link to those boat narration um, positions, if anybody knows someone that may be interested. I'll also just interject here. This is, this is a view from the Hog Island camp boat. Um, some weeks we're very fortunate that these researchers will row out to us and, um, and, and give uh, a little you know, talk to the, the, the folks that are on the boat we do have camp sessions um, most weeks of the summer uh, for adults, we have family camp, uh, and then we have our teen campers as well. And so um, I think in this case, I think you guys rode out and because um, last year we didn't land on the island, but in this coming summer, we are planning to land again for Ooh. a few sessions, uh, our teen <laughs> sessions and the Puffin Island session. And those are mostly almost sold out, um, but we do have a really great camp session I wanna highlight here called um, Birds of Main Islands, and it's a service week. So after the puffins depart, after the researchers depart, we have a week of camp where we take um, our participants out and land on our seabird islands, and they do um, different types of conservation work, including uh, building that outhouse. That was one of the projects that came out of uh, that service week. Um, so we're really supporting our researchers and it's a great way to land on um, Seabird Island later in the season. Just another uh, vantage point of us trying to get back to the landing, it looks like. <laughs> For folks at home, uh, can you describe like what type of boat you're in and how, how, how do you land? 
so that's an inflatable Avon. Uh, I don't. What would be a like a? I think it's like probably. A, I was gonna say it's an eight or nine foot boat, um, basically with a wood paneling kind of bottom, um, and then we had to pump it up all the all the time. So sometimes those are very susceptible to jagged edges and rocks. So when we would put them back, we have to be very careful. But this is our mode of transportation. Um, sometimes we would <laughs> row around the island if we felt like it, if we had some downtime to do that and just kind of wanted to get out a little bit, but this is what we would use to go back and forth, um, during resupplies. And its name is Bodhi. Yes. <laughs> and I did not choose that name. I would like to say <laughs> that, that's like a past teams have passed that name on. <laughs> So we have we have a guillemot in in this picture, which is obviously not a puffin, but look at those red feet, mm -hmm. um, very very bright red feet. So these are one of our more abundant species uh, on the island, and it's really cool to see them mixed in with the other seabirds. But he's eating a rock eel, which is a primary um, diet item for the guillemot. Oh, I'll let somebody else take it. Jasmine. Hi. So, so these are, um, go, oh. go ahead. <laughs> go, go. Yeah, so like we said before, there are other birds besides puffins. This looks like an eider and her chicks. We also had um, mallards and everything of that nature, but this is actually a really nice photo. We had a lot of predation with the eider nests at first. Um, we also had a couple of abandoned eider nests. So it's actually really nice to see some eider chicks walking around the island. So this is, is a really good photo of copulation between it looks like two Arctic terns. Um, Arctic terns are the, the species I, I got to do a lot of the diet study for, which was awesome to see because they, they fly so far, they migrate so far. They're really an incredible species. Um, so basically the, what's happening in this photo is the copulation between the two. Um, so they'll um, touch the cloacas together. And this is um, a site that you see really early on in the season, but it's also a really, uh, cool site to see because that means you're going to see a lot of eggs popping up soon. Um, okay, so that's a, door. <laughs> I was like, ah, okay, so that's a roseate turn. They're my favorites, uh, which is, I, I don't even know why. I think it's just because they have their call is a little raspier and there's a blind on the island where when you're sitting there, you're surrounded by them and they're all talking to each other and it's like this. It's, it's different um and their chicks are really cute they're like they have this little these spiky down mottled brownish um sandy color and they're just like i am interested in all of these birds for research and academic reasons but like i think the way to my heart here was definitely through the spiky hair and rosia turns are always hard to do the feeding studies for because they move so quickly um to the nest and they're a little bit more secretive because they're mixed in with the common terns and the arctic terns so it's definitely challenging with these guys yeah there's also we typically find between 70 to 80 nests um as opposed to the common terns where uh this year we counted something like over a thousand i'm not remembering the specific number and that is a razor bill on the left um we only have a few of them visit us every summer. Unlike there's uh, two, does seal have razor bills? I'm not, why am I not remembering that? Matinicus Rock, which is another island that, that um, is managed by Project Puffin. Um, they have a whole breeding colony of razor bills, but uh, on Egg Rock, we just have them visiting, but it's nice to look at them anyway. So we don't monitor them here, um, but they're always so stoic looking. They're really cool to see. That was the first time I saw one being out there. 
this is a good sunset photo. So we got treated with some, some really nice sunsets, which is awesome. Um, so this is just an example of some of the nights that we would have on the island. So that's it for our slideshow. Um, thanks so much for, for kind of explaining all the different sites and, and views and birds uh, that, that folks can see out there. Um, we're going to open it up. We have uh, a few minutes here before we have our connection speaker. Um, so we're going to open up to some of the questions. So I've asked people to, to drop those in the chat or the comment section. We'll be pulling questions out of there. Um, a few just little preliminary ones that came up. Uh, one was, um, and you touched on this briefly, but how long are you on the island from start to finish? So we were there from May 6th to I believe August 5th or August 6th. So that's three whole months of being on the island, except for me, I, le I left for a couple of days. I had a, a family thing. But, um, so we're there for about three months, which is a long time to think about not coming offshore, but um, definitely, definitely worth it. Another question. Um, from one of our chat here, they asked, uh, so you have that little camp stove, but it looks like you're having some really elaborate meals. Um, <laughs> how, how do you do that? Kay's good at putting everything together. So I'll let her explain the food. Oh, I just do like hodgepodges of things. I feel like Jasmine's the real chef. She was, <laughs> she was a good cook. <laughs> um, but it's funny because my relatives all think that I eat out of cans all summer, but that's actually not true. Um, we, like I said, we get our food brought out to us every couple weeks. Um, and, you know, they, we, we get food from normal grocery stores and are able to have fresh produce at least for a little bit before it uh, rots or we eat it all. So um, we really try to make the most of, of what can be brought out to us um, and then occasionally they'll throw in a, like a special request. <laughs> I do feel like being on the island forces you to be more creative with the meals that you're eating. So a lot of it was trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. More, more, we had, a, we had a lot of triumphs though. I feel like we ate good most of the like time. the pineapple bone. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. even there for that, but that's okay. Uh, that's what you get for leaving us for two days. <laughs> We have a great question from a nine and 11 year old, huge Puffin fans that are tuning in tonight. They say, uh, the question is, how did they become you? Um, what did you, what are you studying or studied in school? How do you um, become a seabird researcher? I, I think it, it's ingrained in you. If you want to do it, you can do it. And that that's the best advice I can give. But I, I went to school for wildlife biology and um, I actually heard about the project from someone. So you're hearing about the project now, which is awesome. Um, so you can plan ahead to do that. And my advice would be to go there now, um, find a way to get there and don't give up on it because you can get there if you wanna be there and the puffins would love to have you. Yeah, I would also recommend um, doing what you can to try to get into the community and then working your way from there. I think Steve, mm -hmm. Steve Cress's story really exemplifies that because I think they first hired him on as a dishwasher, right? At the mm -hmm. Hog Island camp. So, you know, you can, you can, if you're curious and driven, you can make the most uh, of your, make the most of your circumstances. Although I, I will say that um, connections do help. It's, it's kind of an unfortunate reality of the field um, and something that I think, I think is currently being addressed and I'm trying to work to address that. Um, so, you know, accessibility is, is something we should all strive for. Jasmine, uh, any, any feedback for our young folks out there tuning in? So, um, I actually found the project just by happenstance. So I feel like if you know you wanna do something and what you see is relevant to you, relevant to your life, relevant to 
the goals you want to reach out and, and grab, I say do it. I, don't, I say don't let anything stop you. Um, I know what we did was a little rough for living on the island for three months, but if you're dedicated enough, you can make it through. Absolutely. So we're going to have more questions for this team. So for those who are viewing, uh, who are tuning in live, feel free to keep dropping your questions in um, because we will have another chance for a Q&A. But next, I am going to highlight our Audubon Connection speaker. We're proud to have Remy uh, Moncrief. He's the Policy Manager of Marine Conservation for National Audubon Society. I'm going to put you here on the spotlight. So Remy, joining us tonight, talk about what Audubon is doing for seabirds, forage fish, marine conservation policy. I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for that bigger connection. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen really quickly. So my name is Remy Moncrief, and I am the uh, Marine Policy Manager for National Audubon Society. I would like to have this disclaimer that I am not an ornithologist, and I actually have never done birds. Um, I am purely a marine biologist with, marine and, uh, with a background in marine biochemistry, and um, um, I actually um, was studying in the European Union doing a fisheries policy and fisheries law and uh, um, aquaculture and the um, uh, effect of microplastics on uh, mussels. So I kind of get this question a lot, which is gonna be my next slide, is why does Audubon even employ a marine biologist? And why do they suddenly care about fish at all? And we kind of saw it in the last couple of um, slides in the last presentation where we have puffins and puffins absolutely require the greater ecosystem to survive. Uh, there was this there was a photo of, you know, the two dead seabirds and it was as the interns were saying, um, they probably ran out of food. And what happens when you start decreasing the amount of fish in the overall environment, the amount of poor fish in the overall environment, the greater environment, the secondary and tertiary, tertiary uh, consumers, they start to suffer. And so Audubon cares about this because we started to make that connection that conservation has been making for quite a bit of time, that you have to save fish to save birds, and especially seabirds whose diet primarily consists of these small, very vulnerable species. You have, you have to pursue marine conservation. And that's why Audubon is really starting now in the last five to 10 years to pursue some of these really important issues. Some of our current policy objectives, I know that House laws and Senate laws and all of this can be very, very confusing. So I will go slow and keep that at a very high level. Um, a lot of our policy objectives are, oh, part, part of the side, so let me admit that for you. Oop. There we go. Yeah, so part policy objectives are geared towards blue carbon, forage fish, the Madison Stevens Act, men Hayden protection, and currently the Competes Act. Um, this list changes all the time because a lot of these policies go in and out of favor, they go in and out of um, public viewing, and sometimes one or two of them just gain sudden momentum and goes really forward. Um, originally, when I was making this presentation, the Competes Act wasn't the first one on the list, it was the Madison Stevens reauthorization, but because the Competes Act actually just passed the House yesterday, and there is a lot of very good things in it, I moved it to the front. So first with the Competes Act, it is originally uh, an act designed to, to um, increase America's competitiveness, competitiveness with China specifically. Um, it helps uh, increase the production of semiconductors, manufacturing, uh, the supply chain. However, there are a lot of uh, bipartisan support and a lot of um, very wonderful senators and house representatives that have pushed for blue carbon and ocean conservation amendments to be added into this absolutely massive bill. Uh, I'd like to highlight in particular Bonamici, who added 75% um, of uh, the Blue Carbon for Our Planet Act, which goes to create um, a blue carbon database, uh, blue carbon conservation, which is um, helping to preserve uh, wetlands, mangroves, um, uh, kind of that coastline area, coastline ecosystems, um, trying to improve research for um, deep sea events uh, and seeing what their impacts are in the greater ecosystem. And Lowenthal actually added the language to include seabirds as a protected living marine resource, which is absolutely vital because birds and seabirds have very little protections as it is. 
And anything we can do to help save them really, really has a great impact on what we can do further down the line. The next act we're doing is the Madison Stevens Reauthorization Act. Now, it was created in 1976 and last reauthorized in 2006. So it's been almost 15, 16 years before it's been reauthorized again. So this one is very high on our list to see completed. Um, it has a lot of just final protections like climate change initiatives. There's a contest to improve internet connectivity in remote areas and on the sea, um, fortress protections, um, increased funding for research and technology, trying to change the bycatch laws to have bycatch limits and reductions, and a lot of just fishery rebuilding. We're seeing a lot of um, fisheries and a lot of forage fish move north due to climate change. And when you start shifting fish species from where they've been for the past 10, 15, 20 years, they start to move into areas where they aren't protected. Um, the Madison Stevens Act gives a lot of fishery control to about eight councils spread over the United States. And these councils are highly, are highly specific to the fish along their coastlines. And so if a fish starts moving north from say, you know, the Florida coastline all the way up to Virginia, for example, that's a different council that's going to be authorizing if you can fish that fish and what quantities. So it's very important to update the Madison Seamus Act to really address some of these climate change issues. In a similar vein, the Forage Fish Conservation Act is a cutout of the Madison Stevens Act. The Madison Stevens Act is a piece of bipartisan legislation, but on the event it doesn't pass, we kind of want to have a fallback, which is a Forage Fish Conservation Act. This is the act that is really going to help some of our seabird species like puffins, uh, ospreys, eagles, bald eagles really survive because they eat a lot of forage fish and their life cycles are entirely around some of these species. Um, this act would protect species at a low tropic level. And as say herring moves north and starts replacing some of these hake um, species that are no longer there, they need to be protected in the same way that hake was before. It also establishes some science-backed information when establishing something called total cash limits, which is the total amount of fish that can be caught by fishers and um, trawling boats over a course of a season. Next, we have the Blue Carbon for a Planet Act. Um, this was introduced by Senator Murkowski of um, Alaska. And it's really, blue carbon is something we're seeing a lot of push towards, especially in the last five to 10 years. Um, as we try to go for, you know, lower carbon emissions, try to go for a healthier planet, we're finding that mangroves, estuaries, um, coastal communities, uh, wetlands, some of these ecosystems just do a very good job of grabbing carbon from the air, putting it into their leaves and putting it into the soil. And once it gets into the soil, it can stay there for thousands and thousands of years. And so when you start trying to reap or when you start trying to protect some of these areas, it can have a very good effect on helping slow down climate change, helping really preserve some of the integrity of the ecosystems. Um, furthermore, a lot of these blue carbon areas like mangroves are very absolutely vital hurricane and tornado and flood protection areas. Um, the roots of these trees go down and break up wave and break up um, wave energy and it can really protect everywhere behind it from some of these harmful storms and harmful waves we're seeing along our coastlines. Uh, the Blue Carbon for a Planet Act um, would establish an interagency group to study blue carbon because there really is a bit of uh, a lack of information concerning how much we have, where it is, and how much it does. And would also help kind of really give us a good picture of what we can do to restore and protect some of these areas. It would also help adapt nature-based adaptation strategies, which would be you know, the, the natural um, recalibration of some of these areas. And something quite interesting in this act is it would study deep seafloor environments and deep ocean vents and see what their relationship is to blue carbon. Lastly, we have something called menhaden. Um, to those who don't know, menhaden is technically a forage fish. However, it's specifically not covered by the Madison Stevens Act. There are two main bodies of menhaden that we are looking at now. Oh yes, I will get to the, uh, I just checked the chat sometimes, but I will get to this after our presentation if you have questions. Um, there are two bodies of menhaden right now, which we're looking at. One is in the Gulf of Mexico and one is all along the Atlantic coast. Um, I am native to Virginia and because of the spawning habits of menhaden, juvenile menhaden come to the Chesapeake Bay 
And a lot of them congregate in the Chesapeake Bay during that piece of their life cycle, just because of the way tides go. Um, the governance of Menhaden is a bit, a bit political and a bit convoluted. However, we're seeing a shift in populations that we want to address them just because of climate change again. And there is a council the, uh, uh, that the Atlantic states are governing and this council is entirely dedicated or this commitment, this committee is entirely dedicated to determining Manhattan cash limits. There is only one or two companies in Virginia, for example, that even fish Manhattan and they use it for something called reduction fishing, which is um, bait for larger fish, so salmon, and they also use it for things like uh, liver oil pills and things like that. It's, it's, it can be kind of a hot button issue, especially in this area, just because of how many different fisheries require menhaden to survive, but it's something we are looking at. So these are all things that Audubon Society is looking at right now. And even though they're not directly related to birds, we found that if we can try to pass some of these protections, try, try to protect some of these species and really look at how the ecosystem functions in a more cohesive way, we found that it has a really good effect on those species we are about, those bird species and post, and um, for those bird species and dangerous species we are trying to protect directly. And I, again, this is just a very brief overview. I didn't want to go too, too deep into it, but I also wanted to let you know how you can help. The first thing I would say is anything you learn in this PowerPoint presentation or anything you learn uh, from any of the people that spoke in this, talk about it with other people, at least one or two other people, just letting them know that some of these bills are in Congress right now. Some of these bills are being promoted and we require people to just know about them. Um, I know that government policy and politics can feel convoluted and sometimes hopeless to a lot of people. But without the, without the interaction between legislators, mayors, council members, and the public, they don't know what's important to you and your voice gets drowned out. So this blue carbon bill, some of these forestry bills, Menhaden bills, um, and any of these other bills that are going to come up in the next you know, year, five years, two years, 10 years, really just talk about them to people. And the second thing you can do is you can let these representatives know. They have open sessions all the time for these bills in public forums. And really just letting your representative know that you care and you are seeing this bill, it has the ability to really change minds. Um, I have seen it personally with the Forage Fish Conservation Act um, where that uh, representative Dingle actually introduced because originally she wasn't for that bill, but because of some of the advocacy work that our grassroots efforts did, National Audubon did, your research did, she changed her mind on it and turned out to be a forage fish advocate. And that's just one of the ways that you can really see some of this stuff in action. And again, I know, I know politics, especially is something difficult to talk about, but really just letting people know that you care really helps us at Audubon, helps us at Pew, helps us at Chesky Bay Foundation. It makes our job easier because interacting with those around you is the easiest and best thing you can do to gaining and keeping momentum on these really important bills to help save those species that you love. So with that, I hope I have a couple minutes for questions. I do know that um, this is, again, very, very com convoluted and complicated stuff. I hope that I managed to give an adequate representation of what we're looking at and some of the uh, definitions. If I missed something or if I misjudged what I was saying, please let me know and I will. Oh, blue carbon. So there are two types of sinks. Uh, there's a blue carbon and green carbon. Um, greenhouse gases, well, I'll take CO2. They go up into the air from burning of fossil fuels, from volcanoes, from all of these activities. Uh, when the carbon is in the air and in the water, it can be pulled out. Um, it can be pulled out in a couple of ways, but the way blue carbon does it is you have trees, for example, that take in CO2, which is carbon dioxide, and give oxygen. When they take in the carbon dioxide, they don't release it again. They need it. It goes into their cells, it goes into the roots, goes into the soil. When it goes into the when it goes into the organism, it doesn't get released again. It pulls it out of the air semi-permanently. Um, if you cut down that tree, the carbon or the 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 tree decays. And then once it decays, that carbon starts to degrade and gets released back into the air again. Happens from burning, happens from just wrap, just from natural decay of the organism. But once that organism dies, it gets released back again. 
However, once the organism, if that organism is alive, it keeps pulling in more and more and more C or carbon dioxide. Uh, the older a tree is, the more, the better it gets at pulling in carbon dioxide. And so blue carbon is those areas along the coastlines like mangroves, estuaries, places that plants or places that trees, the coastline and the sea meet. And it pulls all that carbon dioxide out of the environment around it and pushes it into the soil where it can't be easily released back into the atmosphere again. So by blue carbon, I'm talking about those areas that pull the carbon dioxide out of the air. Thanks, Rumi. That's, uh, that's a great overview. And, and it's, it's wonderful that you could share things, actionable items that people can take and actually do to uh, support the work. There are, sorry, I, I, sorry, I checked yeah, the chat. Um, there are pages on Autobahn that um, with sample talk with selected officials. I know because I make some of them with, um, and uh, a wonderful, our wonderful communication person, Rachel, she makes a lot of them. So we do have a lot of those sample talking points. If you would like some of those, you can just put your email and I'll definitely email them out to you because yeah, they, are, they actually are fantastic and they are constantly updated with the changes and winds of these uh, legislative bills. So for those who are joining us on Facebook, the question uh, was if there are talking points for elected officials on the Audubon website. And, and as Remy said, there, there definitely are. So we'll try to get those links uh, posted so that you can uh, check those out. So we're gonna open it up to the whole group. I'm gonna pull some questions out of the chat. Um, for those who are joining us on Facebook, you can drop your com um, questions in the comment section. Those joining us on Zoom tonight, you can put them down in the chat. Uh, and then we'll just take turns with a few different um, questions here. So I'm gonna kick it back over to the, the, the Seabird researchers. Uh, one of our questions in the chat was, are, uh, are puffins affected by climate change? Um. It's a big answer to a short question. Um, I can. I, I just want to say first that uh, Remy's work is so important. Like, <laughs> like being out on the island can feel really hard. Like we said, and there are a lot of things intrinsic to being on the island that make it worth it. But really, the thing that, at least for me, keeps me going day to day and making it feel like what I'm actually doing makes an impact is that someone sees what I'm doing and tells someone about it. <laughs> um, and I like, I can't emphasize that enough. So climate change is affecting puffins and like, does someone else want to start talking about how, because it's so complex <laughs> and that's one of the difficulties. So let's practice talking about it. <laughs> I, I wanted to touch on that question because I saw it pop up when it did and I, I felt it. And I feel like this season on the island, we really saw some things that were alarming um, in terms of food supply and in terms of weather and all the rain that we got. And seeing those things firsthand really puts it into perspective for you when you don't live in it every day all the time. Um, and when you're surrounded by this ecosystem, you're kind of that firsthand witness. So every opportunity I, I took to talk to somebody about what was happening, I, I did, because it, it all ties back into this bigger connection. Like all of Remy's work, again, is so important um, and is so necessary to the work that we do. Climate change is no walk in the park to solve the problem, but by having that persevering attitude with it, climate change is, is a problem that's going to be addressed and we're gonna save our seabirds. And you know, you can't give up on that attitude because then if you do, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get stuck. But you know, thanks to everybody who who cares about our seabirds, we're we're not gonna see that. We're gonna keep working towards it. Um, I think to start off, not to even bring it up, but what got me the most this summer was the just the sheer amount of bait fish that the puffin and I brought in. So that was a, a clear indication of climate change that we witnessed and witnessing it firsthand, actually being on the island is so different from hearing about it because you hear about certain things and you make a plan to do certain things, but you never 
not you never follow through, but actually seeing it, it, it builds a drive in you that you wouldn't have otherwise. So, um, sorry. It's, it's really, it gets me really emotional because it's actually very saddening to see, but um, there's sorry. a lot of hope. Yeah. There's a lot of hope there. I did just um, chat uh, audubon.org. Uh, we do have a, a sign up if you want to learn more about different action weeks and different training opportunities that Audubon hosts. So definitely check that out and you can sign up and join one of our um, kind of policy groups, roundtables, so that you can learn more and, and know what to say to the right people. Sorry, Ben. Um, just from a um, tidal movement side point of view, the Northeast Atlantic, that part of the Atlantic, um, or the Northwest Atlantic, part of the Atlantic that borders Maine, is heating up at the faster rate than the Pacific Ocean and the rest of the oceans because there is a tidal movement uh, completely unique to the Atlantic where the top layer of the water um, cycles in but doesn't uh, activate with upwelling at the same rate as uh, other oceans. And so the top layer will get heat up faster and the bottom layer will stay at the bottom. And as a result of this, climate change is accelerating uh, movements and specifically around the main coastline. And that's another reason why a lot of these forage and bait fish are moving further up north faster and they'll continue to do so in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, just because of the way global warming is impacting the Atlantic Ocean. Here with the Seabird Institute and Project Puffin, we are doing a forage fish February. So if you check in on all, any of our social media channels, uh, which would be Facebook or Twitter, you will see different things about forage fish and highlighting how that impacts uh, seabird populations. So definitely tune in and look at the ones that we've been posting earlier this month. Uh, our next question is uh, about plastic pollution. How does it impact bird pollutions? Is it, it populations? Is it a concern on Eastern Egg Rock? Uh, it is definitely a concern on Eastern Egg Rock. So we had a, a period of time where we would go out with trash bags and just literally clean the island. And you could find things from plastic water bottles, Gatorade bottles, balloons were one of the biggest problems that we found. Um, and a lot of times you can see the trash within the burrows, whether we were grubbing for puffins or guillemots, you can actually see the pieces of trash that they would pick up. Um, the, some of the plastics were iridescent, so it caused them, in my eyes, maybe they look like fish, maybe they look like certain things that they would actually eat. So it actually was a, a, a huge problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah, it's easy to assume that because we're uh, offshore and remote that like the effects of you know modern civilization don't reach us, but no, like it, it's all part of the same system. and plastic finds its way to egg rock for sure. And the more offshore islands as well, um, the ones that are 25, 30 kilometers offshore, we're still finding tons of plastic there. This question is for Remy. Uh, we had Kay and Emily and Jasmine kind of talk about how they found themselves on a seabird island, but how does one become uh, involved in policy work? What was your path? And um, how did you get to where you are now? That's a question because I had the most zigzag path of anything. Um, my background is in biology and my minor is in applied conservation, but my, one of my first positions was with the Smithsonian doing exotic animal research. So I used to work with cheetahs and cotton leopards. And then I swapped over to chemistry and biochemistry. And then I used to work for Orange County Water Pollution Control Bureau doing the water chemistry testing. Um, I knew I always wanted to do something with coastlines. So then I uh, got into um, a program with, in the European Union uh, a couple of years back where they uh, gave me a double masters in aquaculture and uh, fisheries policy. Um, but the main theme is taking the opportunity that's in front of you instead of the opportunity that you think you should be taking. And kind of because, I mean, especially marine biology is a, uh, the field is highly competitive and it's very close knit. And so if there's an opportunity for someone to say, if there's a field work you wanna do or something even down the street with a professor or a teacher or someone you know, get involved in that and get involved with it early because 
they said it earlier in the presentation is connections matter, especially in a field as competitive as this, connections matter a lot because you will have many times 100, 200 people applying for the same one position. If you I've already have a good repertoire with the person you want to get with the person you want to work with. They know who you are, um, and really, you have you have to you have to deal with frustration. You have to deal with a lot of work with a lot of work, um, and there is a bit of frustration. But really, dedicating yourself to it and realizing that it's not going to be straight. Um, the only people I have never seen make it in marine biology or marine conservation are the people that gave up because they went to some went to another field. Or they couldn't, or they didn't want to pursue with the frustration. Um, yes, there are easier, there are easier occupations if you're just trying to find the job. But if you want to do so, if you want to do this, then you do, you do have to stick with it. And I, if you stick with it, you will absolutely find something to get through. Thanks so much. Uh, another question from the chat from my seabird researchers. Are you returning in 2022 or what are you doing next? Personally, I'll start off by saying I am, I am not returning, unfortunately. Um, I would like to return in the future, probably within the next couple of years, I would really hope to get back to, to Egg Rock or one of the other seabird islands, but um, I'm gonna continue conservation work by working at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, which is a, a raptor sanctuary in Pennsylvania. So staying a little bit local for now, but hoping to get back to the project within a couple of years. So I am um, actually unsure of my next steps, only because I am an animal science major and my concentration is pre-veterinary medicine. So um, being on the island mainly deals with seabirds and I will I'm kind of looking to branch out, but I do think it's a great opportunity. I would love to return. Um, and for me, this this last summer was my last summer supervising, but I do hope to stay connected with the project. Um, and I'm move forward. I'm moving forward with my dissertation research on uh, social behavior and seabirds and how we can connect it to conservation. And Remy, a uh, question for you. When when are you gonna um, see a puffin on your life list? It's actually a job requirement to go see puffin. Um, they they've told me this. Uh, I actually work with Don Lyons, and he said that he wants to bring me out to go see a puffin. <laughs> so I'm hoping this summer or this spring, at the earliest conveniences, I will go to Maine and go see puffins. That's great. Uh, for those at home, if you want to see puffins, uh, one way to do it is to come to Hog Island Audubon Camp. We have weekly camp sessions where we'll take you out in the boat, see Eastern Egg Rock. You'll see where our research team here was living and, um, and you'll see the new uh, puffins flying in, the terns, um, and, and also get to um, interact with all of our wonderful instructors and volunteers. Uh, I wanna thank my guests tonight the researchers, thank you so much for coming and, and giving people a little insight to what it's like to live on a seabird island. Can't truly know unless you do it, unless you sleep on the island, but I think that you you gave a little bit of a snapshot of what, what that life was like. And Remy, big thanks to you for sh you know sharing the policy work that Audubon's doing and, and ways that people can really get involved at home and make a real difference by lending their voice uh, for the birds. And uh, I also, also want to thank Jean Hall for all of her photos that we shared tonight. Uh, Jean's a volunteer for our project and highlights all the important work that we're doing. So thank you so much. And lastly, I want to thank all of you out there who have joined us for Making Bird Connections lecture series. Um, people like you are the ones who are making a difference. You're tuning in, you're learning, and you're taking the next steps and doing some action items uh, that we're bringing to you each month. Uh, our next presentation will be next month with uh, Hog Island instructor, Catherine Hamilton. She is a world-class bird artist, and she's going to talk about how she uses art for bird conservation. Our Audubon Connection speaker is going to be Audubon Magazine's Jenny Bogo. She's going to talk about the Audubon Mural Project, which is another way that we're taking art and highlighting cli climate-threatened species. I hope you join us. Registration is free. Uh, I'll drop the link in the in the um, chat section. And then finally, um, 
We always encourage that you check out our programs at Hog Island, hogisland.audubon.org. Come and join us this summer. We still have spots in our programs, including our day trip programs. If you can't do a full week, uh, check those out. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much for having us.